Morning, everyone. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. And as I welcome you, I, it just struck me I ought to welcome those who watch online, wherever you may be. God bless you and thank you very much for joining us. We thank God for modern technology that allows us to be here in southern Spain and people watch us all over the world. So we thank God for granting that to us. How are you? How did you sleep? Good. There's a, in Psalm, say that again. Some people short. Oh, some people short, others long. Okay. In Psalm 3, we read this. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many they be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. What am I trying to say? I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. What am I trying to say? It is He that kept us during the night and allowed us to be here this morning. Somebody say amen for God. God is a very nice person. I like God. I love Him too, but I like Him. He is really a nice person who has one desire for your life, and that is to save you in His kingdom <clears throat> when He comes, and He is coming. It is so easy to get caught up in living from day to day, surviving from day to day, that we pay no attention to the biblical fact that Jesus Christ is coming back. The Bible says of God, of Christ, same thing with respect to character, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. A God that hates sin cannot sit back and allow a sinful world to continue forever. He has to come and put a stop to it and uh, usher in a kingdom wherein dwelleth only righteousness. Who is with us for the very first time since we began on Wednesday? First time. You haven't been here during the week. First time, first time, first time. All right. So we're all... Oh, second. <laughs> okay. Well, second is close to first, but not quite the same. Give us your name. Spell it. Yos. J O. I'm going to Nigeria in a couple of days to an area called Jos. J O S. Yes, called. Yes, exactly. All right. Good to see you, my handsome brother. God bless you. How are the children? Do you have children? Nobody said yes, <laughs> but I can see them. <laughs> okay. How are the children doing? Are they in good health? I want to pray partic particularly for the children. Could you bring them here? I want to pray specially for the children. Bring them here, please. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> bring the children. Jesus loved children. Bring them, bring them, bring them, bring them. <coughs> we have one more little angel to come, or two. Usually when I call for children, I get some big children. In the 40s and 50s, but <laughs> they also come. <laughs> all right. Are the children all healthy? Any child sick? 
Who is sick? Oh, he's sick. Throne. Uh, he has a little bit fever. Okay, okay. okay. Any other child who's not well? Um, our children are, are all a bit um, ha having a cold. A cold, yeah. all right. Okay. Uh, who are they? Um, it's um, Yenia. And I have a card in English, is that? Yeah, but she. Okay. She is uh, also. A little cold. And he also. A little cold. Okay, well, that, that, that's the way to smile when you have a cold. Just like that. Just like that. Okay, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for life. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for the invitation, come unto me. We come in the name of Jesus on this holy day. If we've offended you, forgive us, God. I present to you these little children whom you love. You've given them life. The amazing thing is Jesus Christ at one point in his earthly life was exactly their size. Look upon them now with favor, mercy, and compassion, dear God. For those who are not well, heal them, Father. Not just give them improvement, heal those who are sick. Whether it's fever, cough, or cold, remove it from these little bodies and grant them good health. Give to the parents wisdom to raise them to love you, to love your word, to love righteousness. Provide the needs of the families, I pray. And Father, when you come into your kingdom, save all of us with the children first. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Thank you, thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> And that prayer also covers those watching online. And I ought to say that. God loves children everywhere. He really does. Okay. <clears throat> I want us to go to Job chapter 11. And I want someone to read verse 7 of Job chapter 11. It's now 5 after 11. I will release you no, no earlier than or no later than 12. Maybe beyond 12. What book did I say? What chapter? Someone read verse 7 for me. Where's our microphone? Oh, it didn't work. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's just to remind us we're not perfect. We need God. All right. Who has Job 11 verse 7? Read for me. Can't by searching... Find out God. Stop. What does that mean to you? Canst thou, by searching, find out God? What does that mean? All right. Canst thou, by searching, find out? Now, when you say look for God, do you mean behind a tree or under the bed? What do you mean by search for God? In the word, to try to understand God. Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? The answer is no. God has to reveal himself to us. Finiteness cannot discover infinity. Let me say it simply, more simply than that. A limited, carnal human being cannot fully understand a divine pe being. Let me say it more clearly. A sinless angel cannot fully understand God. That's why you read, and I think it's 1 Peter 1, verse 12, the angels desire to look into the things of the gospel. Why? They do not but they are limited. And so when we study the Bible, when we think about God, we need to understand we are entering a subject that cannot be exhausted. God has to reveal himself to us as a reward for our attempt to find out about him. Now, let's try to find out some things about God. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and read verse 8. Well, let's not go there first. Let's go to John 5, read verse 37. John 5, verse 37. Anyone has that? John 5, verse 37. And the Father himself which have sent me. Mm-hmm. He hath borne witness of me. He have neither uh -huh, at any time nor. So Jesus says, he have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Pause. 
Think for five seconds. Then tell me two things you just learned about God. The Father what? He sends out. All right, read the verse how. I, now, read it microscopically and tell me what two things you learned about God based upon that verse. He has a voice. He has a shape. Now, we do not know what that shape means. We cannot believe God is physical because physical things are limited by law. Are you with me? God has a shape nonetheless. There are so many things we'll find out when we get to the other side. In the new world, when God starts to reveal more and more, we will spend days with our mouths open in surprise, astonishment, and delight when God reveals things to us. But Jesus said, you've never seen his shape, meaning God has a shape. You've never heard his voice. God has a voice. All right. Now let's go to 1 John 4, read verse 8. Very familiar verse. 1 John 4, verse 8. What we're looking for in that verse is also found in verse 16. 1 John 4, verse 8, what does the Bible say? He that loveth love not, knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. So we've discovered God is love. Not has love. God is love. That's what he is. All right, let's go to uh, Exodus 20. We read from verse 4. Commandment 2. We're trying to learn some things about God. Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. When you found that, say, Amen. amen. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Now carefully, for I, the Lord thy God, come on, am ah, God is a jealous God. Because he loves. His jealousy exists with his love. Now there are two kinds of jealousies. God expresses the good jealousy. The jealousy that cares about us. I, the Lord thy God, God is so jealous. Let's see the degree to which God is jealous. Go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Read verse 12 of Exodus 34. Sorry, verse 14, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. Thou shalt worship no other God. Mm -hmm. For the Lord, whose name is Jesus. Ah, it is not simply that God is jealous. God, one of God's names is jealous. He does not worship anybody else. For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. What have we learned about God? He has a shape. He has a voice. He is love. He experiences, he experiences jealousy. Let us go to Genesis 6. Now don't think because we read those verses, we know exactly what God is like. We're getting an outline, a shadow. That's all we're getting. Exodus, not Exodus, Genesis 6. Let's read from verse 5. Genesis 6, reading from verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. Continually, now carefully, read the beginning of verse 6. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. What do you understand by it grieved him at his heart? He was? He was sad. God experiences sadness. 
So if he, if he experiences love, if he experiences jealousy, if he experiences sadness, we know that God is what kind of being? An emotional being. I'm not saying he, is, he functions purely emotion. I'm saying God experiences emotions. That's why we have emotions. Why? We were made in his image. Look at verse 6 again. What else do we see? Yes, it, it's as if God experiences regret. Now, I can't explain that, so don't even ask. But it repented the Lord he had made man on the earth. By the way, let me digress. Don't let God say, I am sorry I let him live or her live by the life we live on this earth. Don't let us live the kind of life that leads God to say, I am sorry I let that man live. We have to so live that God looks down and says, I am so glad I gave her life. I am so glad I gave him life because he's using that life to glorify me and to be a blessing. And so God is love. God experiences jealousy. God can, well, let's go to Exodus third, uh, ch chapter 4 and see what else God experiences. Exodus 4, let's read verse 10 and verse 11. Do you have that? Exodus 4. 10 and... All right. Huh? The what? The the oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Don't let that child get lost. All right. Exodus 4, 10 and 11. Who has that? And Moses said unto the Lord, Uh-huh. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a... Now Moses tells that to God because God told him, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses is scared to death. He's finding excuses not to go. He says, I'm slow of speech. He had been gone from Egypt so long, he had lost the ability to speak fluent Egyptian, whatever the language was. He may have had a physical impediment. We don't know now. But he's complaining he can't speak. Now, <coughs> verse 11. Who hath made man's mouth? Or the deaf, or the seeing? Or the mm -hmm. Have not I the Lord? I digress on that verse. Who made your kidney? God. Can he fix it? Yeah. Yes. God tells Moses, you have a problem with your mouth. I made it. If I tell you, run up that hill, don't tell me I have one leg. You see what I'm trying to say? Don't tell me you have one leg if I tell you run up that hill. If I tell you run up that hill, what should you do? Run. Let me handle the one-leggedness. If I tell you speak for me, speak. Leave me. In other words, God does not want what? Uh, what else? Starts with an E. Then an X. <laughs> then a C. Excuses. <laughs> Do not bring excuses to God because God can fix any problem on which you base your excuse. Is that clear? Now, read verse 12. Here's what God tells Moses. To so go, uh-huh, I, I mm -hmm, and teach thee. Listen to Moses now in 13. Said, oh, oh, my Lord, uh-huh, I pray thee, whom thou wilt send. Now, Moses is still hesitating. Read verse 14, and uh -huh, of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Stop. What did you just learn about God? He gets angry. <laughs> God gets angry. God loves. God gets jealous. God feels some kind of regret. God feels sadness. And God can get angry. And when God gets angry, prayer is not towards you. Okay. Let's stay with love. 
Go with me to John 10. We read 16 and 17 of John 10. Then we'll find something that you may find difficult to believe. Almost everything about God is difficult to believe and is, uh, is so profound, it's inexhaustible. That's what I mean by difficult to believe. Do you have John 10? We read 16 and 17. I have, mm -hmm, which are not of this fold. Mm -hmm, them also. I must bring mm -hmm. they shall hear one voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I read with you because those online need to hear. That's why. That's why. That's the only reason why. Okay, we got some information that they're eager to hear the word of God. And so we want to satisfy that desire. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. Not I would like to bring. I must bring. It's almost a sense of urgency Christ is expressing. And they shall hear my voice. And this is the voice of God. Not my voice, this Bible. And they shall be one fold and one now. Read 17 carefully. Therefore, that my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Now, let me ask you some questions. Read 17 again before I ask the question. Read quietly and I'll read loudly. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. When you see because, what do you understand? I am hungry because I have not eaten. I am tired because I worked. There's a cause. Yes. There's a cause. Because. There's a reason. Now, listen again. Therefore doth my father love me because. Well, let me ask you this. Long before Christ came to the world as a human being, did a father love him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hold on to your seats. Put on your seatbelt. <laughs> what is he saying? Yes, but listen. My father loves me because... I laid on my life. But the father had loved him before that. What is he saying? Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> I don't know if I use the word grow, but yes. Now listen to this quotation. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 924, paragraph 5. What did I say? <laughs> I love when you stumble and flumble and fall. Okay. <laughs> Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 924, Paragraph 5. Well, tell me later. Okay. <laughs> Listen to this. Never was the Son of God, Jesus, more beloved by His Father, the Heavenly Family, and the angelic host of the worlds than when he humiliated him or humbled himself to suffer disgrace, shame, and abuse. Listen again. Never was he more beloved than when he agreed to suffer humiliation, disgrace, shame, and abuse. As human beings, what we see is that somehow there was a greater revelation of God's love for the Son. Now that is astonishing. God's love for Christ, insofar as we can determine, seemed to have deepened because of Christ's willingness to give his life for sinners who did not like him. When you look at Christ dying for mankind, let's go to Romans 5, learn something else about God, and we'll come back to God's love appearing to increase. And I have to choose this carefully. What book did I say? Romans, what chapter? 5. Let's read verse 8 and verse 10. Who has 8? Read for us, and I'll read with you. God commended us in that while we were, yet sinners, while we were sinners, 
Now, here's God, sinless God. Here's a sinner. What's the natural relationship between God and a sinner as far as the sin is concerned? What's the sinner's attitude towards God? He tries to avoid God. He avoids God. Separation. Separation, yes. But the natural in the sinner towards God, what's the attitude? Hate. Hate. Mm. Mm, hate. Now, let's see that in verse 10. Read what does that say? For if mm -hmm. we were enemies. Ah, when we were enemies. Go reading. Reconciled to God by the death of his son. Pause. That's enough. Enemies. Now, what does that tell you about God? We have enemies. He loves his enemies. By the way, God loves your enemies. <laughs> you take a while to say amen, but it's okay. God loves your enemies. So be careful how you treat your enemies. Wrong as they may be, God loves your enemies. God loves his enemies. Then how much more do you think he loves his children? Let me ask you this. You don't need to answer. Do you believe God has degrees of love that he expresses? All right. <laughs> Let's... Uh huh. He doesn't look at the appearance. No, he doesn't. He looks here. Let's look at some verses and see what we can conclude under the guidance of the Spirit of God. Let's pray again. Father, as we continue, teach us, God, both in this place and online. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Let's read 4 and 5 of Exodus 19. And for those online, I should tell you we are in Sato Tome, in the province of Hain, Hain, somewhere in Spain, up in the mountains, where telephones don't. That's where we are. For those of us online, that's where we are. Pray hard so the prayers can reach us. Okay. Now, where are we reading Exodus 19, 5? Who has that? He have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Stop. How many nations are in that verse? One. Okay, look again. Two. Two. Name them. Uh-huh. And you. <laughs> yeah, <and> you. <laughs> Who is you? The Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. How? What did God do to the Egyptians? Come on, name the plagues. <laughs> Ten plagues. Ten plagues. What was the first one? Water in the blood. What was the last one? Firstborn destroyed. God said, you have seen what I did to them. Because of whom? You. Are ah, you not with me? The folks online are with me, but you're not with me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I'm an amateur prophet. Now, you see, <laughs> God said, look at what I did to them. To deliver you. Who was closer to God? Don't pause. Who was closer to God of those two groups? The Israelites. But since you don't believe me, and that's fine, believe the word. Read verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be what? Treasure unto me. Keep reading. Above. Wait a minute now. Let's line up all the nations on earth back then. Which one was closest to God? Yes. <laughs> but notice the condition. Read five again. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, what's the next word? Then. Then. He shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Go to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. It's almost 11.30. Time flies. Do you have Deuteronomy 7, book number 5, written by Moses, most of it, except the last chapter about Moses' death. must have been written by Joshua, somebody else. 
All right, read verse 6 for me. For thou art a, thou art a what? Holy people of the Lord. Keep reading. Hath chosen. Pause. What does that tell you about God and the Israelites? He. When you choose, what do you do? You make a. But is it accidental? What is it? It's conscious. It start with a D, then an E, then an L, then an I, then a B, then an E, then an R. It's deliberate. <laughs> I thought I'd go until two o'clock. It's deliberate. <laughs> It is intentional. It is purposeful. I consciously, with my eyes open, I chose you to be closer to me than any other nation. Closer to me. Go to uh, Leviticus 15. Read verse 26. Leviticus 20, verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, come on, for the Lord am, and have severed you from. Why? Yes. What does sever mean? All right, give me another word. You. <laughs> God says, I have cut you off. From whom? All other nations. Why? Look at the verse. Aha. Uh -huh. In other words, to be a true child of God, you must be cut off. Not necessarily physically, but by virtue of the standards you now follow. You are cut cut off from the rest of the world based on the standards you follow. So you're living on this house, in this house, your neighbor's in that house, your neighbor smokes, drinks, whatever, you follow different standards, you are cut off. Even though you live next door. I have cut you off that you may be mine. I'm showing you some people are closer to God than others. That's just a fact. Now, if God does that, I don't complain. Okay. Go to Malachi 1. Let's read from verse 1. We're looking at God and our relation to Him and him to His to us. Malachi 1, reading from verse 1. The last book of the Old Testament. Lovely book. Read it sometime entirely. You have that? Read with me. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Keep reading. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Now take a deep breath. Read on. Yet I loved Jacob. Come on. And I hated Esau. Stop. <laughs> Does God hate people? Don't say yes. It's from that verse. Are you with me? But when studying the Bible, you've got to study a little over here, a little over there. So one can explain the other. Now go to Genesis 29. Let's read 30 and 31. Of Genesis 29. 30 and 31. <coughs> Do we have that? Not yet. Okay, not yet. That's an honest answer. Blessings upon you. Genesis 29. We'll read 30 and 31. All right. Who is reading? And he went in. And he went in also unto Rachel. Rachel. Uh-huh. He, he loved also Rachel. Come on. Ah, stop. This is Jacob. And he went in unto Rachel. Wanted to have a child with his wife. And he loved also Rachel what? More than Leah. Now, finish the verse. And serve. And Yes. The total years he, he served for Rachel amounted to 20. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible is clear. Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Read verse 30, 31 now and think. 31. What does that say? And when the Lord saw that... Ah, wait a minute, wait a minute now. 
The Lord saw that Leah was, what does that mean? Ah, blessings upon you. You're not only good looking, you're intelligent. Leah, to be hated, is loved less. Now, go back to Malachi. Malachi 1. <coughs> read from verse 2. Are you there? Let's read. Love you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, come on, and I hated Esau. Now, let's put that in modern Santome English or Santome Spanish. I loved Jacob, come on, and I. Ah, uh, Esau less. But did he love Esau? Yes. He loved him? Then he loved? Or he preferred Jacob above Esau? question for you is God willing to prefer you above somebody else yes <laughs> let's go to uh, <coughs> how many disciples did Jesus have who walked around with him or wherever he went 12 on some occasions <coughs> he only took three name them Peter James and John. On the Mount of Transfiguration, go to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Read verse 1. And after six days, Jesus. Yes, he takes whom? What did he do with the other nine? He left them at the bottom of the mountain. And if you read further in that chapter, when the transfiguration was over, he told them, don't tell them. Don't tell the nine. Did Jesus love all twelve? Yes. Were the three closer to him? But who was closest to him? John. The Desire of Ages, page 524, paragraph 1. What did I say? <laughs> 524 paragraph. Listen carefully to this beautiful uh, quotation. The Savior bless all who sought his help. He loves all the human family. But to some, he's bound or tied by peculiarly tender associations. His heart was knit by a strong bond of affection to the family at Bethany. And for them, his most wonderful work was wrought. What was his most powerful miracle? <coughs> Raising Lazarus. He deliberately reserved his most powerful miracle for the family closest to him. Now, here's some good news. There is nothing to prevent you from being in that group that is closest to Christ. You didn't hear me. It's my fault. <laughs> Let me say it differently. You can make it your ambition, your life's desire to be close to Christ. Like John leaning on his breast. You and Christ like this. Go to John 17. John 17. Let's read from verse 9. You have John 17, verse 9. You read, as I read as well, that our friends online may hear. What does it say? I pray for them. Who is them? The disciples. They were listening to him praying. He's praying. I pray not. Come on. Stop. Recite John 3.16. <coughs> For God so loved the world. <laughs> but what did Jesus say? <laughs> I'm pray right now, I am praying for them, not for the world. <clears throat> well, who was closer to him, the world or the disciples? The disciples. I pray for them. 
I pray not for the world. By the way, <coughs> it's very comforting to know that Jesus prayed for you. Did you hear what I said? Because when Jesus prays for you, who prayed for you? God. <laughs> now, how can God's prayer not be answered? Jesus prayed for the disciples. Now, let's go to verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. For whom is he praying? Not just for those in his presence. Yes. Point to some future followers. They're right next to you. Cornelius, he's dead. They're right next to you. <laughs> They're right next to you. Let's deal with the living. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Jesus prayed for you. You don't look impressed. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> what can I say that's more powerful than that? Jesus Christ prayed for you. And we know the Father had to answer that prayer. I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those closest to me right now in this hour of crisis. I'm about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane in the very next chapter, John 18. He's in there. He will suffer after the, tri the judgment hall, tried, beaten, scourged, crucified. I am and pray for them. Now, let's go to verse 23. Now, that verse has a statement you will not believe. <coughs> it does not change the statement. Whether you believe it or not, but I hope you believe it. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, careful now, finish it, and hast loved. How? Yes. <laughs> Let me simplify it. When you give your life to Christ, and you obey him. God loves you as much, finish my words, as he loves Jesus. The prime minister cannot say that. He loves you. Joe Biden cannot say that about me. He doesn't know me. The king of the universe, the creator of heaven, the father, the heavenly family loves us as much as they love Jesus. The problem is what? <coughs> we don't believe it. And God never honors unbelief. He can't do it. We don't believe it. You see, unbelief is a natural reaction of the flesh. We, we, we doubt naturally. Go to verse 26 of John 17. And I have to them thy name, and will declare it carefully now, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me, come on, yes, the same love you have for me is in them. My friends in this place online, when you obey God, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. But let me put something in your mind that wants you to think that I'm really crazy. John 3.16, say it for me. That he gave his only, that whosoever should not but have... All right, think with me now. You may have heard it on one of my sermons, but I love to say it. Look at the verse carefully and identify three people or three groups. Who are they? God, world, and the Son. Use your imagination now. I can't move. Okay. Here's God. Now, not me, but here's God. Here's the Son. Here's the world. And here's God dab in the middle. He has to make a choice. Are you with me? 
Listen to the verse and keep visualizing God, the Son, the world. Let me put it differently. God, the sinless Son, the corrupt world. For God, so love the world. That he gave up his only begotten Son. So that God is saying, I prefer to go through eternity without my son than without them. Let me say it differently. God was willing to lose to win us. For God so loved the world, describe the world, corrupt, mm -hmm. hating him, anti-God, anti anti-truth, anti-righteousness, anti-morality. And God looks at them. He looks at Jesus. I want them. I don't want their sins. I want them. But if you, it may risk losing him, I'll take that risk. Listen to Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou? Aha, uh -huh. here's God again in the middle. Here's Christ on the cross. Here's a sinful world. He has to forsake one or the other. He forsakes Christ for a while. I said for a while. He turns his back. And Christ feels what it is to be absolutely separated from God for what? He feels that. That God might save us. Let's look at it again. Father, if thou be willing, come on, remove this cup from me. He's bleeding through his skin, suffering in the garden. Here's the Father. Here's the Son. Here am I in the raw sewer of sin. Jesus the Father. Jesus says, Father, take this from me. But if he takes it from Jesus, mm -hmm, you take it. Forget the world for a minute. Put yourself in that situation. Forget the world with individuals. That's why the shepherd went in, in search of one sheep. He left the 99. This is not a group thing. This is individual. He left the 99. Why? Because he saves us one on one. And so here's Jesus. Father, take this cup from me. God says, no, if I take it from you, I'll have to give it to Randy Skeet. And I can't do that. You drink it. So he doesn't have to drink. Put your name in John 3.16. For God so loved Arthur, that he was willing to lose Jesus. This is no joke. Salvation came with a risk. The love of God for sinners. That's why God's love is mysterious. We don't even love family members that way. God Launch in his kingdom very badly. Is Jesus present with us now? Yes or no? Yes. yes. How? Through the Spirit. Are we with him through the Spirit? Yes. Go to John 14. Let's read from verse 1. You know it very well, I'm sure. Have you found it? John 14, reading from verse 1. Let me pray again. Dear God, continue to be with me as I speak to those whom you love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Say it with me. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told... Let me pause on that and digress as usual. I like that about Jesus. If it not so, I will tell you. Which means... Christ tells us what we need to know. If I had changed the Sabbath, come on, I would have told you. 
Oh, come on, am I talking to myself? <laughs> if I wanted one man to marry two women, I would have told you. If I wanted a man to marry a man, I would have told you. Aye, that's the kind of God we serve. We live in countries where governments hide things from us. Jesus tells us everything we need to know. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for... Let's look at the pronouns. Let's start again and look at the pronouns. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house I may... If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you... I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that you may be also. What do you notice? This are you, are you, are you. Relationship between God and? He dropped his people, God and? No, no, well, don't be so kind to me. Between God and? Me. <laughs> Thank you, but God and you. Me. So Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. You go coming for you. That where I am, finish verse 3, then are we with Jesus now? In a certain sense, yes. In another sense, no. Can you touch Jesus now? No, why? He's in heaven. You are here. So for Christ, that's not good enough that the Holy Spirit represents him. He wants to represent himself. So he's arranged for us to be where he is and for him to be where we are. So that we can look in his eyes, walk with him, bump up against him. That where I am, God desires a level of closeness. So close the wind can't pass between the two closer than two coats of paint because he loves what God loves he wants close to him and so he says I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place he did not ask an angel to prepare it. he is doing it. and if I go and prepare a place for you I he's not sending Gabriel to get us He's coming himself. That where I am, there he may be also. He could also say that where you are, there I am. Because when all this is finished, the headquarters of heaven are put on this earth. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21 verse 3. God's throne moves to this earth. And that's where he lives forever. With him. Now, the Bible gives us a hint. There are other worlds where people live. That's not where God puts his, his uh, headquarters. He puts it on this earth with us, the only world that sinned. That's L-O-V-E. Let me tell you something else about the love of God. Go to uh, Le uh, Leviticus, not Leviticus, Luke 24. Luke 24. <coughs> Luke 24, let's read verse 36, from 36. You have Luke 24, from verse 36. And as they thus spake, what happened? Jesus, stop. In the Greek, that's called the intensive. The verse could have said Jesus stood in the midst, but it said Jesus himself. You see, God never wants you guessing that he's the one moving in your life. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them what? Peace be unto you. What does the next verse say? Okay, keep reading. And they were terrified and affrighted. Why? They supposed they had seen a spirit. Now, Jesus convinced them, I am not a spirit was way back before he became human. Now I'm human. I am not a spirit. And he said, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold what? 
My hands, come on. Yes, it is I. Here again we have the intensive. It is I myself. Not someone who looks like me. Why does he say, behold my hands and my feet? Yes, he came from the grave with the marks of the crucifixion. But he came from the grave with a different body. Go to Philippians chapter 3, then we'll come back to Luke 24. Philippians uh, 3, let's read from verse 20. Do you have Philippians? Philippians is probably the happiest of all the epistles Paul wrote. He had a lovely relationship with the Philippi church, church of Philippi, really did. You have chapter 3, verse 20. Read with me, for our conversation or lifestyle or citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Lord, who shall do what? Change our, that it might be fashioned like unto his. Ah, so we have a vile body and a glorious body. Jesus lived on this earth, not with a glorious body. We'd want just like ours. Vile means subject to whatever disease and death, all that sort of thing. He came from the grave with a glorious body, which is the body we will have in the resurrection. Now, even though he came with a glorious body, he said, look at my hands and my feet. He deliberately kept what? The marks of the crucifixion. Then he told them something. What did he tell them? When he said, Behold my hands and my feet, it is I myself. What did he tell them? Handle ah, handle me. Question for you. What did he mean? Yeah. Spiritually, symbolically, how? How? Physically. Mm. Grab me. You can't grab a ghost. They thought they'd seen a spirit. You can't grab a spirit. <laughs> because Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. You see that? In the now, is he extending the same invitation to us to handle him now? Yes. But by faith. Which is higher than the physical. Ah, you're not with me. By faith which is higher than the physical, through the word of God, we handle Jesus and see it is I myself. We serve a God who falls over himself to convince us I am real. Is someone sitting next to you? No? <laughs> God is more real than that person. Handle me and see. In Malachi 3, God says, Prove me now herewith, saith Lord of hosts. It is no different from handle me and see. Prove for yourself that I'm real. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see. Come on. Prove it. God wants you convinced he's real and something does not have physical in order to be real. Why did I go through all of that? Christ rose from the dead with this glorified body with the marks of the crucifixion. In heaven right now, Christ has the marks of the crucifixion. When you and I are resurrected or translated, when I say translated, what do I mean? We never physically die. When Christ comes, we go straight up with him. We change, go up with him. We don't die at all. That's translation. If we die, he raises up. That's resurrection. Okay. When Christ comes and we're translated or resurrected, will we have any marks of the crucifixion? But are we supposed to die with Christ? <laughs> Yes. Will we have marks? No. Picture this then. Use your imagination. Here is Jesus. And here are you. Walking down Hallelujah Boulevard in the new city. 
<laughs> and somebody looks at you and looks at Jesus and squints because there are marks on his forehead. There are none on yours. And then Jesus waves because everyone is right in the new world. And the person squints again. Why? There's a mark in his hand, none in yours. And the wind blows and lifts the toga of Jesus, and there's a mark in his side. The same, the same wind lifts your toga, and there's no mark. And the person now, something's not right. What did he do? What did he do? And what will you say immediately? Nothing. It was I. Then how come he has the marks? And you have none. And you respond with a one, one word that has four letters. Love. The thief on the cross will walk through heaven with no marks. He'll walk next to Jesus who will have marks. Nebuchadnezzar, that cruel man, will walk the streets of heaven, not even a pimple. Christ will walk next to him with marks. God's love for you is the love he has for Jesus. And without being sensational, he was willing to lose Jesus to save you. So then you can decide for your own self, maybe he loves you even more. How should you respond to that kind of love? Give your life to him. Give your life to him. The biggest favor you can do for your family is be a godly man. Is to put God ahead of them. I didn't say that clearly. The biggest favor a husband or father can do for the family is to put God ahead of the family. That family will be protected. The biggest favor you can do for yourself as a student in university is to put God ahead of your studies. Under all circumstances, putting God first is an act of supreme wisdom, intelligence, and common sense. One other thing about Christ. I see he'll have the mark of the crucifixion forever, which means he will be what forever? Human, while still God. But what people will see is human. Not an animal, a human being. Christ will carry human form forever. Is love expensive? Yes. Salvation is costly. It costs God everything. It only costs us our sins. Mm -hmm. God says, give me your sins. That's all I want. And God gives us everything. Let me ask you a question. Think before you answer. You have two seconds to think. Does God owe you anything? No. I mean, I've heard people fuss about God. I was a vegetarian and now I have cancer. What's wrong with God? Nothing's wrong with God. I mean, but God is never wrong. Are you with me? I live the moral life. I can't find a husband. In this world, you shall have tribulations. There is never anything wrong with God. And Jesus Christ will look like you and me. Make a comment, ask a question. We'll be on 12. 
let me ask you this, but don't answer me. What good reason do you have for not giving your life to Christ? Don't answer me. What good argument can you present to God? You see, the choices are, <clears throat> I give the life to God, or... Mm -hmm. I may have to say that 10,000 times before it sinks in. The choices are, God directs my life, or the devil directs my life. Now, what good reason do you have for not giving your life to God? Who gave his life for you? Here's what Jesus said about himself and the devil. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not, but for the to kill and to destroy. That is the devil's desire for your life. But if you're a farmer, you're raising pigs or cows, before you sell them, what do you make sure, what do you do for them? Before you sell them to be butchered for meat, you fatten them so you get a good price. You think you're being blessed and you don't belong to God. The devil is fattening you for the kill. God slims you down <laughs> that you may pass through those narrow gates. <laughs> Are you with me? Satan fattens you for the kill. The thief cometh not, but for steal, destroy. I am come, finish it for me, that they might have, and that they might have it more abundant. Yes, God's desire is your life. Satan's desire is your death. Case closed. Everything falls to those two things. The devil wants to kill you. God wants to save you. And to save you, God died for you. Satan never died for you. Never will. He wants to kill you. Choose life. Choose Christ. Choose God. If not for your sake, for the sake of those little angels. Because children tend to become what they see in their parents. If not for your sake, for their sakes, and her sake, their sakes. What have you learned this morning? <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. It's not emotion that determines his behavior, but God has an emotional side. Mm -hmm. What else? God does not hate people. As strange as it may sound, when God destroys sinners, it will be an act of love and justice. God loves his enemies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he loved? Yes, he was willing to lose Christ instead of the world. Mm -hmm. And we make it personal. He was willing to lose Christ that he may save you and me. What else, what else have you learned? We can decide, I want to be close to Christ. Not necessarily more than him or her. I just want to be as close to Christ as I can. Now, let me show you how close you can get to Christ. I was about to finish, but uh, my habit is to five more minutes. Okay, go to Ephesians 5. Let's see how close to Christ you can be. And he wants you. Ephesians 5, we read from verse 25. <clears throat> and you haven't told me once to slow down, so it's your fault fault but I still love you but it's your fault Maybe you don't want me to slow down. oh well you know you should want me to slow down <laughs> do you have Ephesians 5 yes. father in heaven as we come to the end continue to bless us with understanding in this building and those online in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. read with me husbands love your wives pause all husbands say amen, amen. <laughs> okay husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church come on and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle anything that it should be and without all right now verse 28 what does that say come on read so ought men to love there. How? Okay, pause now. We're using something physical to teach a lesson. A man ought to love his wife as if his wife is himself. In other words, if a man hits his wife, he's in himself. 
And nobody walks around hating themselves. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Next verse. Oh, keep reading. <coughs> love with himself. So spousal abuse is self-hate. Ah, nobody's listening. You're thinking about the food. Okay. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Which means he that hated his wife, come on. Yes. That's the extent of the union between the two. You know, some Ellen White wrote, Eve was Adam's other self. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's powerful. His other self, Eve. She came from here. Now, next verse. For no man ever yet, uh -huh, but nourisheth and teacheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now, Paul wants us to understand how close Christ is to us. He talks about husband and wife, not mother and child. Husband and wife. Read verse 31. Verse 30. Yes. Uh-huh. Pause a minute. Where is Paul quoting from? Genesis 2, verse 33. And Adam said, this is now, bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. Called woman, why? Because she was taken out of man. Now, the Holy Ghost has Paul using that to explain the relationship between Christ and the church. But let's forget the church, Christ and you. Christ wants you to be bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. So you and Christ are truly one. Read verse 24 of uh, Genesis 2. Therefore shall a man leave him and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be? Paul takes that and says, that's the way it must be spiritually. You and Christ, one. You the church. Christ, one. We're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. That's the closeness God wants with us. And Paul uses the closest bond on earth to express that. A wife and a husband, you and Christ. When you have that kind of union, divorce kills both people. Mm -hmm. It kills both. You can't cut me in half and eat, expect one half to survive. Divorce kills both. How many of you would like to be that close to Christ? Can I see your hand? I believe you. Stand up with me. For those of you online, I hope you make the same decision. The same decision. You want to be close to Christ. Born of his bone, flesh of his flesh. One with Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, give it to him right where you stand. You say, how? You simply say, Lord, I give you my life. Take control and guide me. Repeat that every day. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. We eat all the time. That commitment every single day. Father, I give you my life. Take it and direct me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, dear God, which is mysterious. But you have revealed enough of your love to soften our hearts, dear God. To bring tears to the eye. Because such a love does not exist on the earth, but it should. You are love. You are the source of love. Your love is self-sacrificing. You were willing to lose your son if that is what it took to save us. But we're glad he was not lost. We want to live with him physically, literally, face to face. Father in heaven, forgive us where we've fallen short. Forgive us for our lack of faith, dear God. Now, Father, convince us a little more powerfully of your love for us. It's an undying love. Lord, impress us more powerfully of your deep desire to save us and our children. As we leave now for lunch, let us meditate on what we've heard. Truly, God is love. Keep your arms around us, Father. Let us live in your bosom, the only place of safety. And when you come into your kingdom, save us, dear God. Our children ahead of us and those online as well, 
We pray in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen and Amen. See you at five o'clock? Yes. Uh, oh, no, it's not five, seven. Seven. Seven, seven, seven. seven. sorry, sorry, seven. Um, and I'm convinced we've got... Uh,